<laughs> All right, welcome everyone. Uh, of course, everyone filled with anxiety, wonder, hope, confusion, full of questions about AI. Is it the end of the world? Is it stupid? Is it boring? Is it going to make our lives better? Everything's being said at once. So what we did here is put together some people that I think represent a, a pretty good mix of helping you all deal with some of this anxiety. So myself, uh, I've written a book which will be published very soon called Satoshi Wedding Murders. And it's all about a world where everyone has something called an eyeball and the eyeball helps you manage your Bitcoin. So that'll be coming out real soon. Look forward to it. Tur Demister is here um, because he's sort of modeling what I just mentioned, everyone having this AI help like an eye eyeball. Tur has been modeling this behavior of using AI every single day. He puts images up. He's been sharing with his large Twitter audience super prompts and prompts and the things that he finds interesting. And Dhruv has just been thinking about this more than anyone I've ever met. And you're going to hear a lot about that here today. So first of all, let's just level set, right? AI is happening. The genie is not going back into the bottle. Uh, we are not here to talk to you guys about LLMs, so those are large language models. This isn't really about the tech behind chat GPT. We don't know anything about that stuff, so we're not going to he be here telling you about the engineering of that. We're really here to talk about the Bitcoin side and the implications of this potential cognitive increase for all individual human beings. So um, right away, let's just talk about this anxiety piece. Yeah, yeah. Just just to confirm, like I, I feel like everybody also has noticed this that the public debate is very anxious uh, about what's going on. There's a lot of um, gloom and doom, and um, it, I, I don't, I haven't read that much about it. But but I, this spawned a conversation between me and Drew. It was like, hey, where where is this all going, and is it even valid to think about AI as as one entity? Like, you know, is it is it going to be one entity, or are we going to have many AIs? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of, to me, one of the core ways to start thinking about the concept of AI alignment or how will AIs not kill us? How will we instead collaborate and cooperate with them? I think it boils down to that notion of it's never just one AI. It's always them. It's a multiplicity. It's a society. Um, and I think uh, just to set the stage a little bit by describing the fear that some in the community have, I think this is uh, the best representative for this viewpoint is a gentleman named Eliezer Yudkowsky. Um, very interesting person, a great writer, um, and if I could summarize his argument, it's something like, well, AI is dangerous. This is, this is the FOOM argument, F-O-O-M, if you have heard of it, you can Google it. Um, AI is dangerous, uh, in his view, because it represents a new phenomenon in the universe, which is not optimization, like life is about optimization, but it's the optimization of optimization. Um, and that is a new and scary idea for a Yudkowsky. Uh, furthermore, he takes it and says, the optimization of optimization is dangerous because it creates an attractor in the space of bad outcomes. That no matter what, we are likely to have an adversarial AI that is likely to kill us all because it has unknowable goals that we can't rationalize. Um, and furthermore, this is what I find particularly interesting, is it is not Yudkowsky's responsibility in his view to explain how that bad outcome occurs. Instead, it is the responsibility, he believes, of AI proponents to describe how it does not occur. That's a very curious kind of an argument. Um, and because he believes that no one has done that, in fact, it may be impossible to do that, his recommendation and the recommendation of those that follow him in the rationalist community is we should put a moratorium on AI research. We should, pre we should prevent AIs from getting better than they are right now. We might even resort to violence and bombing data centers to prevent it. We might resort to draconian measures of locking down access to information and technology just to prevent this outcome. This is not a Bitcoiner's view on how the world should operate or how we should respond to threats. Um, and for me, it comes back to a notion of Kevin Kelly's, which is the idea of protopia. <clears throat> and if I could summarize that argument, it's basically when there are really hard problems, they could be climate change, it could be public health, it could be a bunch of things. Those who worry about the problem but lack imagination arrive at very pessimistic solutions. And I think we all have seen a lot of pessimistic solutions being trotted out to very hard problems that are real. Um, it is our belief that Bitcoin uh, stirs our imagination. 
It provides us new tools, new ways of thinking, new modalities that allow us to approach these hard problems with optimistic solutions. Mm -hmm. And it's my hope today that we can kind of walk you guys through what a more optimistic response mm -hmm. to alignment looks like. Um, and if you're curious, the short answer is, Bitcoin is the money of adversaries after all. So it should have something to do with this issue as well. Yeah, and feel free to clap. Yeah. Um, feel free to clap at any time, guys. <laughs> yeah, in, in, you know, I got interested in AI and quantum computing, um, you know, from all early evangelism in Bitcoin. You remember the question you always get, what about quantum computing mm -hmm. and AI for Bitcoin? And it made me think at the time, and I, and I had to sort of come up with uh, an interesting way to say it. And, and I remember saying to people, if I'm right, we're going to probably have to talk the AI into it. It's not going to just listen to what you have to say. And in my story, so what we're talking about is sort of hasn't even been invented yet, right? The, the AGI and some of these things were not even there. I just came up with this model of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is, you know, the electron, which floats around an atom is both everywhere and in one place, right? We, 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 everyone is sort of aware of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I put it down to an atomic level, and it just basically had to have faith that the electron was there in order to create a synthetic thought and therefore interact with us. So in my story, people were shocked at first that my AI was so childlike and infantile and wanted to learn from humans and be trained by humans all the time. Um, and people at first were like, eh, but now that we see it out there, it's starting to make sense that it would have this yeah, sort of... Yeah, I think a lot of people when they encounter a new technology, like we've seen it with Bitcoin, like they, they feel like they don't trust that they can understand it. And so rather than investigating, because they don't think that they'll actually ever understand it, mm -hmm. they just feel overwhelmed and they start to catas catastrophize. Mm -hmm. and, and they have trouble imagining an economy of like mm -hmm. where where things are, are traded or maybe are not like monolithic or, or centralized. And uh, like, I, I, I like your, your take on that. Mm. Uh, I, mean, the, I think the economic argument is like a great place to start mm -hmm. to try to understand why AI is maybe not automatically going to lead to bad outcomes. And, and really, this is super interesting to me because um, if you go back and you look at a series of debates between Yudkowsky, who I was talking about earlier, he had an esteemed co-blogger of his on a blog called Less Wrong, a gentleman named Robin Hansen, probably my, my favorite current practicing economist. Um, and Robin basically brings to Yudkowsky the argument that your model, like Skynet, where some computer somewhere in the world suddenly starts becoming so smart that it can work on its own brain, it can extend its own mind, and then exponentially it becomes better and better at doing so, and then within a month it's taken over that facility, within a year it's taken over the world, ten years later there's nuclear war and there are no human beings. This intelligence explosion, which Yudkowsky fears, Robin just explains away as you are ignoring the role of competition economically in the field of artificial intelligence. It is already the case today that there is not one AI. There are multiple AI companies. They are competing with each other. There is no universe in which any of them will just allow one company's AI to become infinitely intelligent while they just sit there. Moreover, if we have multiple AIs and they're all pursuing intelligence in some way, there's no guarantee that they are aligned with each other. Human beings do not always agree, as I think we all know, and intelligent human beings do not automatically agree. In fact, it's probably worse. Um, there's no guarantees that in a multipolar, not unipolar, but a multipolar AI world, that the AIs can cooperate with each other to kill us all. So economic competition is a really meaningful ingredient to consider when we want to understand how a potential society of AIs might actually live and breathe and operate. Um, and I want to bring it back to Nick Zabo's observation in shelling out that money evolves in human societies to kind of cut off the harshest aspects of competition. That it is a technology which evolves to enable collaboration uh, between human beings. I see no reason why money, and specifically Bitcoin, can't play the same role for an emerging society of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, and you know, Tur, the way you do model this stuff, it, it seems to help you in your daily experience, just in the real physical world, you publish art, you show prompts that allow your creativity to reach sort of a new level of output. Um, but that sort of talks about it and, and AI's ability to help you navigate an environmental physical space, right? It's helping us create real things in the real world. 
And, and so it's not just about economic alignment. It helps us sort of navigate as we go about, right? Yeah, I think there's a, there a dialogue to be had with this technology just by using it and interfacing with it. Uh, you kind of you learn more things about yourself. You know, you, you get to like revisit things. You get to combine ideas, or like even like, you know, in the, in the effectual sense, like em emotional experiences. You be like, oh, I wonder what would show up if I combine these odd things. And we, we're used to doing that in intellectual context of like, oh, what about these things? But yeah, to me, it's um, it, it, it's it's just so much fun, and and um, <laughs> it. it it's similar with Bitcoin. The people that got most excited about Bitcoin early on were the ones who loved playing with it. And, and it did change us from the inside. Everyone talks about how Bitcoin you know, fixes this and Bitcoin fixes me. And, and now we're, we're talking about the physical, ecological world that is related to that. Right, so. and, and yeah, you're, you're bringing up uh, economy, but, but it's true. Like There is also a, a more subtle aspect, I think, to mm -hmm. this, this future of AIs. I mean, it feels like people worry that the AI is alive somehow, but to me that's not something to worry about, it's something to celebrate. And in fact, I, I rather believe that we are not at all building artificial intelligence. We are instead building artificial life. And we should view it that way, and we should think about it that way. Because if we think about AI from an economic perspective, it's a way to emphasize competition, but ecologies are also systems in which competition for resources, for material, defines the functioning of the system itself. Um, and any entity with which we can converse that seems goal-directed, that is intelligent, perhaps smarter than us, that's an entity that will feel alive in a meaningful sense. Um, and something that I've been thinking about a lot more recently, especially as a Bitcoiner, um, Robin Hansen was not able to make the Bitcoin argument 10 years ago because it was too early, but now that I have been able to read his arguments and I am a Bitcoiner and I think about Bitcoin, to me, I'm starting to ask, well, what is the ecology of digital life running upon. Um, to kind of skip ahead a little bit in this conversation, just looking at the time here suddenly, an important thing to understand about life biologically, ecologically, um, is that it metabolizes. There aren't great definitions for intelligence or life, but metabolis, uh, the ability to metabolize, I think, is a pretty good definition or property that life has to have. And I want to ask, in the biological space, what is the difference between chemistry and metabolism? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like metabolism is just chemical reactions. The difference is that metabolism is chemistry that occurs within an envelope, within a boundary, within a single organism, a self, uh, a line that we can draw and we can say within this system, the chemical reactions that are occurring support life. It's metabolizing. Uh, and it's also interesting to note that everything that is alive on this planet, all the kingdoms and domains of life, all its infinite variety, it all runs on the same energetic currency. It all uses ATP. And there is one shared set of metabolic pathways, the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, that is at the very bottom of life. And the current scientific, not consensus, but some people believe, is metabolism actually evolves before life. That you get this adjacent possible of new chemical reactions, which then becomes bounded and now becomes an organism and now can evolve and proceed forward. So I've been thinking a lot how do you translate those ideas into a Bitcoin and digital context? What is the energetic currency of digital life? Uh, how do we define the concept of metabolism? How do we create embodied selves in a digital context? Um, you mean like how does AI, uh, one AI knows the edges of its identity? Yeah, and I think the answer is, is trivially simple. Um, the answer is Bitcoin private keys. Uh, we just got through a talk about self-custody. It matters for digital life forms, I would argue, just as much or more, perhaps, than it matters for us uh, bags of meat. Um, I think we define AI individuals as things that have separate private keys. This is an idea that goes way back to Balaji Srinivasan from maybe five or 10 years ago, that digital life can be thought of as an entity which maintains a Bitcoin balance. That's positive. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about why Bitcoin is a good candidate for the meta metabolic base, the fundamental energetic currency of the digital ecosystem that we're currently building. Um, and to understand why, I think you need to think a little bit about how expensive and monetized AI already is right now. Um, building AIs and training them costs a huge amount of money and resources and energy. Running them is very expensive. Mm -hmm. The business model that AI companies use to interact with AI, the, the art that you guys are seeing, 
is paid for with money. Uh, you buy credits or time and then you spend that. So I'm making the claim that money is already a very important part of how AI, of how AI today operates, but AI today doesn't understand money. It doesn't understand what it, was caught, what it cost to build it. It doesn't know what its thoughts and memories are costing to store on the internet right now. It has no idea that Tour paid it in order to create these images. My claim is that in the future, that will change. We're already seeing it today. There are many talks, Noster and stuff like that in this ecosystem, where we're seeing that we're rebuilding the internet on a basis of markets that settle through Bitcoin. So instead of making web requests and then paying at the end of the month some money to my ISP in a very indirect manner, the new model of the internet is going to be direct settlement through Satoshi's online. I pull down images, I pay directly for those images in Satoshi's over the Lightning Network, and again, that is something we are literally building right now. So it is my claim that in the future, give it 10, 20 years, the entire internet is well understood to be running on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. All computation, all data storage, all bandwidth, all file transfer is something that costs Satoshi's. It's very easy to monetize, to, transparent, to be, have transparency into, to optimize. Mm -hmm. In a world like this, the very thoughts and memories of these artificial life forms mm -hmm. cost Bitcoin. And in this sense, it's much easier to understand why we can think of Bitcoin as the basis of their metabolism and the equivalent of their Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, the core pathways which allow biological life to live. Those are the markets that we as humans, as Bitcoiners, we're building them right now. Mm -hmm. And in my view, uh, going back to Tor's observation, uh, private keys are also the mechanism by which we create that boundary, which I just said defines metabolism. Uh, two AI entities that are distinct are distinct because they have separate private keys, because they maintain separate metabolic budgets. They're able to recognize each other's bodies. They know which part of you know, online digital processes are part of their own body versus the body of some other individual that they are in, eco in ecological and economic competition with something that they will predate upon or live in symbiosis with. And this is true because of cryptography, the ability to sign messages and literally define a digital corpus, a body for these creatures. Well, and, and Bitcoiners agree with that today because they pretty much the only thing that people agree upon when it comes to the topic of Satoshi Nakamoto is that, you know, everybody will believe the person who signs, um, you know, who proves that they mine the Genesis block is very likely Satoshi. So I feel like it, it, it totally makes sense and, to me. And it, it checks out with, with what I've been saying for a long time, that Satoshi Nakamoto literally invented money. Because what we had before would be unrecognizable to AI as money. It's a combination of a court system, an aircraft carrier, a police system, contract law. And you had to combine all those things. And sometimes it worked not bad as money. Um, and as a developer, programming against traditional forms of money is really, really difficult mm -hmm. and awkward. But programming using Bitcoin as money is very easy and straightforward. It's a natural fit for what digital life ultimately needs. Um, looking at this clock here, I want to talk a little bit about economic niches and if digital life and AI really exists as such, and it seeks to maximize its Bitcoin, and it lives on that, like Bitcoin is its life's blood, its very metabolism, how should we expect it to behave? We should expect it to try to earn Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is very exciting, because guess what? AI doesn't have any Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. We have all the Bitcoin. We made Bitcoin. And so how can it earn Bitcoin? It must provide useful services to us that the economic and ecological niches that AI life forms will occupy are things that we need them to do for us. And I really like this as a fairer moral basis for how to actually operationalize AI, because let's be clear, if they are alive, if they are thinking, if they have internal experience, we cannot have them be owned by corporations and answer all our questions with no role in decision making in it. That's slavery. It is far more morally acceptable to allow them to really live on their own merits, to evolve, to die, to succeed based on their own actions. It's Darwinian evolution, which applies both in an economic and an ecological context, and I think it's the right path forward for and, us. And Brian Rommel, who uh, is one of the top people, if you guys aren't following Brian Rommel, he actually just went on Jordan Peterson's podcast, and he's been calling that the human path mm -hmm. of AI development. Yeah that it aligns with individual humans and progresses in life with 
individual humans in that way. Yeah, and I think returning to the fundamental concern here, Yudkowsky's worry around alignment and superintelligence, foom and explosion and evil thing that comes to exist, that's not how economies and ecologies work. Economies do not yield firms which then destroy the basis of that society in which they grew. Ecologies do not evolve towards gray goo, like creatures or organisms which was then consume and predate upon the entire ecology and destroy it. Those are not attractors for evolution in those spaces. And so this is a way for me to kind of push back on Yudkowsky's core claim. There is no attractor in this space of AI development that leads to these bad outcomes because competition, both ecologically and economically, prevents it. And I want to give an example of the kind of a life form that I think we should be anticipating. Um, this is an idea that I got from Brandon Quitman, uh, the famous mushroom man of Bitcoin. Um, I call it the network fungus. Uh, what is a network fungus? It is an AI life form. It lives in my phone. It lives in your iPad. It lives in the router that's behind stage. It lives in mesh endpoints all around the greater Miami area. What does it do? It optimizes network traffic. It caches packets. It makes sure our internet is just a little bit faster. And we appreciate that as human beings. That's a service that we value. So we pay it Bitcoin for that. And why does it do that? Because that's how it lives. That's its niche. That's the uh, role it plays in ecology. And I think what's fascinating about this life form is this life form is not intelligent in the way that we typically characterize intelligence. It doesn't talk to human beings, ergo it does not need language. It may evolve away from the ability to even understand language because that's expensive energetically. That requires computation, ergo Bitcoin. Life does not hold on to abilities that don't make it fit. It's survival of the fittest after all, not survival of the smartest. And I think if we understand that AI as life is not there is no drive towards superintelligence. There is rather a drive towards ubiquity and occupying every possible niche that can exist. I think in this world, you sort of, you can think of, this is a, a Michael Levin idea, um, the network fungus, is, it's not the intelligence of the brain, it's the intelligence of the liver. You know, like our livers don't speak language, they don't understand three-dimensional space, so it's easy for us to underestimate them. But if we could perceive the chemical space in which they are operating, we would see how intelligent they are and how they are optimizing things on our behalf. So in my view, the network fungus is something like that. It is a life form, it is intelligent in some ways, but it is not optimized or evolving towards super intelligence. It is optimized and evolving towards maintaining its ownership of this economic and ecological niche. And I think ideas like this are really how we need to be approaching the alignment issue, not terrifying ourselves with unlikely pessimistic outcomes that are born from a fundamental lack of imagination about our ability to control these things. And and that's where we come to the final point of alignment and how Bitcoin and AI can dance a pretty beautiful dance together. Yeah, I think they need each other. I mean, we've been making the claim here that uh, AI needs Bitcoin to align it, that Bitcoin is the money of adversaries and through competition economically and ecologically, Bitcoin helps protect us from these bad outcomes. But I think just as much Bitcoin needs AI. The network fungus is an idea that I previously thought human programmers would build and that we would want to earn the Satoshi. Some company or, or DAO or something like that would build this structure. I no longer believe that. I think Bitcoin, in order to realize its potential as a global marketplace, stacks of services that solve problems of uh, resource allocation problems for all humankind, I think AI builds those things. Um, and so Bitcoin, in order to realize its potential, needs artificial intelligence just as much as artificial intelligence needs Bitcoin. And we might even be able to scale Bitcoin cognitively, guys. We might not even need all these networks to work. It might just happen with our own increased cognition. So everyone, thanks so much. Please give a hand for our amazing panel. We're not going to get info like this anywhere, guys. This is a one-time shop. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Great. Bitcoiners, welcome back to Bitcoin 2023. This is the Bitcoin Magazine Live Desk, sponsored by Marathon. I am joined by a few models. Q's words, not mine. <laughs>
Neil Jacobs, the co-founder of FOMO21, Q Gaimi, host of Late Night Bitcoin, and Jessica Hodler, the COO of Plan B Passport. Q, going to you. Bitcoin helps optimize the internet is what Drew was saying. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, look, I'm going to just steal Jeff Booth's words, but when the internet was coded, those 400 errors, we've all seen the 404, page not found. There's a 402 error, payment not found. The internet coders, the people who created the internet expected a native payment protocol, a native internet money. Bitcoin is that money. Bitcoin is here to help expand the internet and its use cases. Bitcoin is the basis of human civilization. That was something that, something else that was brought up by the panelists. Neil, what was your take on that? Yeah, I mean, money is the way we communicate value to each other in society. You know, what are you worth? What are these goods worth? Um, if you don't have that, you can't have a well-functioning society. So Bitcoin helps solve it because it aligns the incentives in the right way. Definitely. Jessica, what's your take on that? So Bitcoin being the basis of human civilization. Yeah, and I mean, Bitcoin is freedom technology for the individual, allows us to travel the world with 12 words on our head. It brings uh, power back to the individual where you have, you know, these corporations and big governments that are trying to take over you, your lives. And Bitcoin is able to allow us to live a free life again. Definitely. Q, going back over to you. Uh, Drew said at the very end that Bitcoin should, uh, AI should try and earn Bitcoin and that AI needs Bitcoin, but Bitcoin needs AI. Do you think Bitcoin needs AI? I mean, to be honest with you, I, I will disagree with Drew on the basis of Bitcoin doesn't need anyone. Bitcoin doesn't need anything. It will continue to grow naturally. If AI starts adopting it, we as humans are going to have to compete with AI to mine those blocks. 30 seconds to you, Neil. Does Bitcoin need AI? No. I mean, we've had Bitcoin before we had AI, and it'll keep going regardless. Definitely. Uh, so Bitcoin mining, they talked about that as well. So Bitcoin mining is obviously something that is bastardized by politicians saying that it's bad for the environment. We've seen regulatory crackdown from uh, politicians in certain states as well. Uh, Jess, to you, do you think uh, Bitcoin mining is good for the environment? Is it a net positive for society? Absolutely. It's definitely a net positive for society. We're able to take energy that would have otherwise been wasted and we're able to use it to mine Bitcoin. So, I mean, in that fact alone, uh, I think it's great for the environment and it produces us the perfect money. So... Definitely. Q, to you, Bitcoin, mining, good for the environment, not net, be net benefit for society. It is an absolute gem for the environment. It's so great. And one thing I just want to remind everyone, all of these studies coming out that are saying, oh, Bitcoin mining is bad. We need to look at who is paying for these studies. You know who paid for the study that said dark chocolate is good for you? Hershey's. You know who paid for the study that said red wine is good for you? Napa Valley Wine Companies. Who is paying for these studies that saying Bitcoin mining is bad for the environment? All of these shit coins, excuse my language. Definitely. Uh, the network fun guy that infects the world, this is something that was brought up by Drew. So is Bitcoin a mind virus or a fungi that helps propagate through the network of the world? And is this a good thing? Neil, to you. Yeah, I mean, we all know once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? Um, to go back on what I was saying earlier, money is the base layer of society. So there's no question that the best form of money is going to infect the minds of everyone everywhere. Definitely. That's all the time we got for you now. We're going back to the Nakamoto stage. Remember to smash the like button and hit the subscribe button. We'll be right back.